Switzerland have been arguing that the festivities will be before of their new Christmas. But it is not disappointing in the sense that uh, Justice Kelly is concerned. emotional um, constructions of the world or the worlds in which they live and they imagine. And just to take you back, of course, to the, the meaning of our seminar series, which challenges uh, our assumptions about the meaning of learning, how children learn, and how we might recognize that, and the fact that children, um, you know, uh, take a, a large box in which uh, a new kitchen appliance might have uh, arrived, sit in it, and imagine that they are navigating the rough seas and that they are Peter Pan in uh, a, uh, a Disney film or, or something is, 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 is quite common uh, uh, for us to, to witness, but uh, seemingly less attractive to researchers who work on questions uh, about learning and ignore the fact that, of course, children have uh, strong imaginations, and they use artifacts and tools such as cardboard boxes and so on and so forth with which to construct and make meaning. And that is the subject of um, today's world, uh, work. It's, it's construction of, of, of worlds. Another group of researchers in, in Sheffield have found that uh, television game shows particularly and soap operas not only produce sites around which social discourse is formed in the household, but also in schools. I'm sure you have your, your own favorite television soap operas, and I'm sure very few people might have missed the, uh, the Indian remake, the, the Bollywood remake, it actually was a Hollywood uh, remake of Who Wants to Be a, a Millionaire? But uh, it is, of course, a game show, a television game show in England, and uh, where a teacher realized that children living in a working class community, <clears throat> which was hit by poverty and unemployment, related well to the television program, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? So a game show, based obviously on, uh, if you answer a number of questions right, you, you, could, you could become a millionaire overnight. The teacher asked the children um, to write three questions for their own class version of the quiz show, show as a homework task. Parents were as committed and excited about the tasks the children were engaged in, joint reading and writing activities as they researched and wrote the questions together. The questions were then sent back to the school and placed in the class quiz booklet. Each family was given a copy of this collectively produced quiz booklet and the, the show, if you like, was replicated uh, the following day. So... Colleagues in the Aga Khan Foundation, who know my interest in reading and the fact that I collect 18th century children's books, uh, because through that uh, one obviously is able to not only construct an interesting history of uh, colonialism, how the world was portrayed through children's uh, authors, but there's also a fascinating social history because these were Sunday school and other prizes, but of course uh, a, a vast interest in, in the subject said to me, look, <clears throat> there is a television game show in Kyrgyzstan you might be uh, interested in taking a, a look at and uh, thinking about it academically because uh, the anecdotal evidence was that this television game show was a, uh, <clears throat> was, um, you know, a national attraction that uh, approximately one million viewers were viewing the show every week. In fact, it is now in its third series, 26 episodes each uh, series, 45 uh, minutes each. So this was launched in 2014, and it was called the Reading Together uh, program. So it's a, a game show that um, invites um, parents and their children to come and to contest, if you like, the prize. But it's not a million pounds or dollars or, <clears throat> or the Kyrgyz equivalent, 
It is actually a game show which at its heart is built around reading books. And the game show essentially is one that attempts to encourage children and their parents to read together in, in, in homes. And this, of course, became a fascinating proposition. So very much like, like Marsh and her colleagues in Sheffield, who studied who wants to be a, be a millionaire and the fact that, it, um, that it's, a, it's a show common, commonly watched and saw the educational value uh, for schools um, uh, uh, in, in that show, uh, this offered exciting possibilities. So the game show involves parents and uh, children who are contestants and who compete, um, uh, who, who complete a number of child-centered and interactive reading comprehension tasks. For example, drawing alternative endings to stories or developing a drama about a particular book or its character and so on. So lots of role play, uh, lots of open-ended um, questions for not only the children to engage in, uh, in collective activity, but also uh, their parents. There's a panel of judges that often includes Kyrgyz uh, celebrities, government officials, uh, and reading experts to determine which team of uh, parents and children are awarded the first place in the competition. Now, I'll talk a little bit about competition uh, towards the end of the talk, or maybe in, in questions. And uh, it's often seen as a, as, as, as a bad thing, particularly in societies in, uh, in, uh, you know, like, uh, like this one, and that education shouldn't encourage competition. Uh, but actually, there are cultures in which competition such as this is, is, is very, very healthy, and uh, it, uh, it attracts uh, a huge amount of attention in, uh, in schools and becomes a, uh, an important organizing plank. But, but perhaps save that as a, as, as a question that's interesting to explore uh, sociologically or anthropologically. Uh, but I'll, 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 I'll move on from there. So, um, what does this study actually, um, what is the study looking at? A key question is to understand the mediating role that television watching plays in the development of reading and how it might be used to stimulate learning-oriented cultural activity and dialogic interactions in the home. So remember, one site in which the television is beamed to a million and more people is in the home, and the argument is that children with their parents, not obviously not every night, and the show runs twice or three times a week, sometimes on a Saturday morning, and perhaps on a Wednesday evening, but there are, of course, the occasions where families engage in very normal and meaningful social, cultural activity, such as watching the television, sometimes with the pizza, glass or something, uh, but they do, they do speak with each other. There is social dialogue, there is interaction, and I think there are lots of anthropological studies that, uh, that, that give weight to that argument. So television watching isn't necessarily the sole isolated uh, activity that, uh, that, that, that uh, it is often made out to be. Of course, it, it, can be, it can be that, and many parents are concerned about children having televisions in their rooms and uh, all sorts of things, computer games, and uh, I have to say I always choose research topics and things to write on that uh, will always leave me not a millionaire, but there are some colleagues in the, uh, one of my colleagues in the United States uh, chose to write a book uh, called uh, What Does uh, Computer Games Mean for Your Children's Education, or some title like this. And uh, the book sold out, and it's now sort of in its 14th or 15th reprint. But the, 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 the educational message, message of course, um, was, was stunningly clear that uh, even computer games that do often set very high levels of um, intellectual challenges. And he studied his son and his, his, uh, his nephew who were gamers, as they called it. Sorry, I'm going off topic, but I think it's important. Who were gamers, and um, uh, spoke to them about their gaming behavior. 
and was surprised to learn that their gaming behavior, rather than displaced reading, sent them to the libraries to find books on the particular games that they were reading. And they were reading more frequently and certainly at higher levels than their classroom curriculum because they needed to find ways in which to resolve these particular problems that the games had set for them. I think the game was something to do with cities and uh, somebody sort of gets on a computer and destroys your city and you have to rebuild it and so on. So you, know, you need to know about defences and all sorts of naval and military uh, uh, sort of tactics. But anyway, um, but that's just another illustration that uh, we sometimes take for granted that technologies of this kind, old technologies like television or newer technologies like games and uh, small screens, uh, <coughs> mobile phones and so on, uh, are necessarily bad because they displace other kinds of, as it is constructed, potentially more useful educational and learning activities. The argument here is that there is at least a theoretical basis that might allow us to see possibilities for tools such as television, small screens, large screens, games, and so on, uh, to be mediating artifacts, things that are used uh, to develop uh, and, uh, and spur and accelerate uh, learning in a way that um, uh, you know, we, we, are, we are yet to, to imagine. So the theoretical impetus is that learning occurs in activity with others. It's uh, stimulated and mediated by cultural tools or artifacts, books, televisions, computers, smartphones, um, these are essentially resources that invite social interaction and cultural engagement and are means with which people think. Now, I know, you know, the, the, uh, uh, lots of the, the sort of cartoons that we see with, you know, friends and families out for a meal, no communication, everyone's on their sort of smartphone, sort of texting each other, you know, even across the table and, uh, and so on. And you might think, oh, well, that's a lot of nonsense that these, uh, these, these cultural tools or artifacts uh, don't invite uh, social interaction. Uh, they, they, uh, they suppress it. Um, but uh, importantly, uh, the argument is that these tools uh, do act as resources with which people think. And, uh, you know, for those interested, the, the theoretical background to this is, is substantial. Uh, and uh, uh, I'll talk a bit about that uh, just in, in just a minute. But that the television as a medium, also important for the study, bridges the geographical sites of the home and the school and accounts for the production of overlapping texts, writing, talking, drawings, illustrations, models, etc., that allow for knowledge exchange and transformation uh, between the home and school. Now, this has always been and is still a big irritant amongst teachers. How do we engage parents more? Parents are really important for, for learning. But there seems to be a curriculum of the home and a curriculum of the school, and, the, and, and most attempts at engaging home seem to be unidirectional. Schools send out things for parents to do with children, collect resources, help them to bake a cake and so on, and maybe they'll come back to school and say, these are the results. But uh, certainly for me, the potential of this television game show opens up the potential for a bi-directionality. The fact that the texts that are created, and by texts I mean the social interactions, the discussions, the discourse, uh, etc., is, is more able to, to, cross, to cross sites. So what this um, study does, actually it's, uh, it's two studies in one, so uh, the Agahanu are funding it, uh, are getting a, a good deal uh, from, from, from this. Um, uh, the first, uh, the first uh, um, uh, notion of the study is, well actually, I, I mean really, uh, there are three studies, and I'll just talk very quickly uh, about all wrapped up into one. The first is actually what we call learning on the box. And this is critically 
uh, this is uh, uh, important, and uh, the study is concerned with the deep understanding of the television game show itself in the way in which it is organized, structured, and importantly, its use as a tool for learning. Does the game show in its structure offer a model for collaborative problem solving, meaning making, creative thinking, and um, do the activities promoted on the game show enhance uh, comprehension, deep understanding of books read, what new meanings do children and their families bring to the reading materials, does the show invite an authorship of new texts and so on. And so, so, you know, so these are, are, are pretty uh, deep and I would argue interesting questions, but this is a study of the game show itself. And that of course has a very limited um, rate of participation. Uh, it's children who are selected to participate in the show. Maybe save that for questions. Uh, I won't go into the, 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 the kind of selection, but you have about 80 participants um, uh, over a series of, of 26 shows. So it's a limited uh, model, but it's important because uh, it is, in fact, a television game show that is being funded. And it, I think, is right to ask the question whether it itself, that whole organization and structure, provides affordances for learning. Those who participate, do they learn? Or are they merely, you know, a little bit of fluff on the side, nicely dressed and uh, uh, enjoying a little bit of the, uh, the limelight and becoming television stars? Or actually, do they learn on the box? Right? And that, that, that's the first uh, uh, question. So uh, the way we're going about this is, is actually selecting a number of episodes, uh, the video footage uh, of this, and um, we are uh, conducting an analysis supported by behavioral analysis software where we look at the educational content of each show, the different segments uh, we e examine. And um, if I were just to skip to a slide, there it is, you can see the kinds of findings uh, that we're getting. This is just rough and ready, um, which is my attempt at, uh, at one episode because I speak neither Kyrgyz nor Russian. So just a, um, just a little plug for anyone interested in a, a little research job. If, you're, if your Kyrgyz is, uh, is, uh, is good, uh, see me. Right. Um, but that's, that's the kind of thing we find from very close uh, analysis of the television game shows. These are just some uh, codings uh, in there, the, the types of activity, expressive reading, and so on and so forth, uh, and uh, beginning to build a picture of what the affordances, um, of what the affordances are. Um, uh, here you uh, will see some of the... Um, uh, some of the activities, this is a group of parents uh, working with their children to answer um, um, a, set of, uh, a set of questions uh, posed by the uh, television hosts. So there's a lot of collaboration uh, and mediation, I would uh, suggest, um, where parents work uh, with their children. And these parents, of course, have been involved in preparation for the show, reading together, anticipating the questions that uh, might uh, that might be be asked. So that's uh, that's wonderful. I'm going to just spend um, another few minutes, but um, um, I have a presentation on a different medium. But uh, well, that's uh, that's important. And why talk of multiple modes of communication when you only use one? Um, <laughs> so um, the uh, is that so? So the uh, this is actually just. Uh, uh, a, a draft paper that's being worked up. Are we there? Yeah. Uh, right. how, how do I see it on the screen? No, I don't. That's okay. Okay. Uh, so um, this is uh, this is just a wonderful photograph uh, taken just quite recently in uh, in uh, one of the homes in in, in Kyrgyzstan. The study has already visited uh, with the research team there. Um, um, Half, uh, well, two dozen or so um, homes, and we were interested in the, the other aspect of the question is, of course, whether the television game show, as it is beamed into a million homes, has the potential for uh, altering, if you like, the, uh, the culture of, uh, of reading. 
So the first question is, does it in itself as a show create affordances? The second question is, uh, we know its reach uh, into a million homes, but does it, does, it, does it make a difference? Does it make a difference? And, um, uh, and particularly, is that difference uh, sustainable, you know, um, in uh, uh, periods where the game show isn't, isn't running? Um, um, apologies about uh, the media, but it was only a, a slide that I was, uh, was looking for, um, which is that one, uh, and then I'll, I'll end. So um, the three questions, uh, all of which we're still working on, the game show itself and a deep analysis of its structure and the affordances it provides for learning. The second is actually what the game show brings to homes. And there's an untested analytical framework, which I'd be very interested in your feedback on, but uh, um, the, 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 the framework um, is, um, as you can see, in, in, in four quadrants, uh, the idea that, or at least the test for us, the research questions are, does the television game show enrich the culture of the home? So does it act as a stimulus for individual and shared reading activity? And I think from the data that we've collected in homes, the answer to that is a resounding yes. It's popular, it's, 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 it's watched. And uh, it, does, it does stimulate reading. We've got all sorts of uh, quotations and, and, and so on uh, to, to, uh, to, to evidence that. I, I won't go into that. Um, but the same question applied to schools. Does the television show enrich the work of teachers? Uh, teachers who teach literacy, teachers who teach uh, other aspects of the curriculum. And again, here, I mean, this was astounding. I think this was an un, you know, not so much an unintended consequence of uh, what the uh, the people who created the show um, set up. They didn't. They didn't actually anticipate that its reach would stretch into the schools. Of course, teachers are parents, some of them, uh, and uh, and others, uh, you know, might might watch the television, but. Um, so I think we um, so far visited about 70, 72 schools and without exception teachers in these schools and, and the evidence is you know, not simply oh we watch it and we think it's a very good uh, uh, way that complements our teaching I mean, they, they, they identify segments of the show and demonstrate where and how it becomes part of the, uh, the literacy and learning curriculum. So the question, does the television show enrich the culture of teaching and learning? And again, we have strong evidence uh, that that is, uh, is an absolutely resounding yes. Uh, the second question is, uh, at least an, uh, academically, a, a harder test. Right? But that's what we, we do as academics. We try and set hard theoretical and conceptual tests. And the harder test is, does the television game show transform the social and cultural practices uh, 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 in the home? So, you know, a, a, a real transformation in the way in which people use books and engage with books uh, and so on. And again, I think the evidence is absolutely that the potential of this show uh, is, is great um, uh, for doing that. We, we have to, and, 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 you know, the political scientists uh, amongst us, the... Uh, area studies specialists who know and who have worked on Central Asia, particularly Kyrgyzstan, uh, would also understand that over the last uh, number of years, the, the, the very difficult um, social and cultural uh, context of, of conflict and uh, poverty and, and so on has, has also meant that uh, families uh, themselves were <coughs> divided, some uh, either uh, uh, become single parent families where one uh, or another of the household, you know, worked in, uh, in Russia in order to, you know, so, so, so people would understand that. And uh, we would also understand that perhaps the culture of reading nationally uh, is perhaps unlike what one might find in Moscow or uh, the tubes in London where, you know, um, uh, 
mostly because people don't actually want to talk to each other. Everyone hides behind the book on the, uh, on, on, on the tubes. But that's great. So there's a kind of national culture of reading and literacy. I you know, spoke about uh, uh, a time I spent uh, doing some work in, in Zimbabwe and knew that I had to get up you know, at 6 o'clock on a Saturday morning to get a local newspaper because if it was 7 o'clock, it was all sold out. But it's those sorts of indicators of a, a, an established national culture of reading. And the argument here is, of course, the show has this enormous potential to transform uh, homes, but uh, it would be foolish to suggest that the political and economic cultural context, the national context in which Kyrgyzstan finds itself at the moment, can be resolved through a television game show. It's going to need more than that, isn't it? It's, you know, it's going to need a, an entire economic reorientation and a refinding, if you like, of uh, a national culture that did exist. But as far as the show is concerned, uh, you know, ab absolutely the potential for it to do so. And again, without a doubt, does it have the capacity to transform the culture of learning and teaching? Um, strong evidence uh, here, uh, lots of pictures if, uh, if, uh, if, if that's what you're interested in. In schools replicating the television game show offline, so they run their own version. They run their own version. They compare. They get parents engaged. Very much like the, the March et al. study in Sheffield. Um, this is a way of inviting uh, um, parents to join in uh, in this game. It's very popular, particularly because of its competitive edge and, uh, 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 and so on. So a great enjoyment. And that uh, illustrates, if you like, the third... Um, uh, element uh, of our study, the potential for the game show to uh, provide us with a platform of bi-directional knowledge exchange and transformation. A very powerful concept because this isn't one, as I suggested, that is unidirectional where the school sets the, liter the literacy agenda and parents respond. This is one where a literacy agenda might be set in the homes of parents, their own social and, uh, uh, understandings, dialogic uh, engagements, and bring that uh, into the schools. So, a wonderful vehicle. There are some recommendations, obviously, for the national television show who produces it and how they might make that um, you know, a, 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 more, uh, a more interesting uh, possibility, how to deepen you like the reach of the, of the show. But um, I think I'll end there, shall I? And um, leave it to colleagues to uh, respond and leave some time for questions. All right. My name is Art Duba. I'm the president and executive producer at Discovery Learning Alliance. And I'll say a little bit about when, uh, who we are in a second. But just great to be here. Thanks for the invitation. Um, David, thank you so much for, uh, for giving, giving me this opportunity. Can, do you know if the folks online can hear OK? Do we need to worry about the lapel mics or anything? <coughs> Everything's good? OK. Um, well, well, first, just in, in, in brief response, I know there'll be time for, for Q&A after. I think the things that you're talking about doing with this study are, are quite exciting, and it'll become obvious when I talk about the work that we do, why um, it's so exciting to us. But I think learning, we have a great opportunity to learn from the things that you'll be looking at, um, what your findings are, but also your methodology is going to be extremely interesting to us. I think there is a fair amount of, of work in media and education you know, in the UK and in the US, very little, precious little, in the developing world and um, developing communities. I think there's a growing body of work in, in 
behavior change communication and mass media and health mm -hmm. in the developing world and exciting results there, but, but not very much in education. So we'll be excited to, to keep very close tabs on, on that work. Um, from our side, we'd be happy to, um, I'm sure um, Ian Diffid would, would agree, to share with you the evidence and the studies that we've done in some of our mass media shows. Um, particularly in partnership with them, um, to the extent that it's um, it's helpful. You'll see the goals are quite different, but there may be elements that could be useful to you. Um, I'm especially excited about the, the why. As you dive into those things, you find out, you know, this had an impact, this had an impact. But taking that next step and understanding why um, could be interesting, not just in, in Kyrgyzstan, but in then how could one take that show or that format and apply it to various geographical and cultural contexts. That would be very exciting. And, and that, that why may have a lot of cultural you know, pieces to it. So it's not sort of that there's a cookie cutter sure. that you can just take. Maybe a little bit more complex and who wants to be a millionaire um, and the popularity of that show. But there are pieces there that we'd love to, um, to, to deconstruct um, and help inform our work. So, um, I'll, let me just tell you just a quick little bit about Discovery Learning Alliance, and then I'll share a little bit of um, one particular experience that we've had in, um, in mass media and show you a short, um, a short video clip. So Discovery Learning Alliance is a nonprofit organization that was started by Discovery Communications. Discovery Communications, the parent company of Discovery Channel and Science Channel and Animal Planet and TLC and lots of other networks, some of which um, you've probably heard of. And they established us to use media as, as a tool to transform education and improve lives in the developing world. So meant to be working outside of the US and, and, and the UK and, and other areas. And really do it in sort of two categories, you know, in the classroom, in the school, and then out of the classroom in, in mass media. In the classroom, we sort of bundle, um, typically, and it looks different in different situations, but often bundling teacher professional development and training uh, video content uh, development and distribution, sustainable technology, whatever sort of screen is, is the right sustainable solution for, uh, for that context and community. Um, and then community engagement, making sure that the, the parents and family members, that the whole community is engaged and, and helping to, uh, to support the school and that work. So that's sort of, in a nutshell, some of the work in school. And then out of school in mass media, uh, we do things like behavior change communication or around um, HIV and more recently tuberculosis work we're um, about to launch in a couple of months through feature films, narrative scripted feature films that one would go to because they want to see a great movie about you know, a Kenyan football uh, player. Um, and then also uh, talk shows, um, uh, television shows um, with the goal of, of shaping um, and creating a, 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 an enabling environment for education, which we'll talk about um, just tonight. But one of the things that, um, that excites me about some of the things that we do and what you were talking about, David, with this particular show is that it's, it's fun. I mean, part of the reason, you know, people watch media and engage with media is because it's fun. And I dare say that's like the least used word in any education <laughs> conference you go to. It's like everybody walked in and had to say, well, I promise I will not say fun at any time in this conference because it's just never used. And it's okay. It's great to use. It's, Maybe it's not the most scientific word, um, but we all can engage with it, and it's one of the reasons why, uh, why we engage in this work. So let me tell you a little bit about something called Discovery Plus. Um, we have worked very closely and, and very enthusiastically with Department for International Development here in the UK and their Girls Education Challenge, this grand challenge of getting more girls in school and learning. That, that last part is really key, because for many, many years, there was this push getting more girls in school, but if you're not learning, uh, you know, attendance and enrollment uh, is, is not really the, the goal. So it's been very exciting to work with them on this. And while we've had this mass media project going, which I'll talk about, we've had projects in schools um, happening simultaneously. So while this talk show has sort of a national reach and a very broad reach um, to the public, our work in schools is, is much more targeted, uh, working in relatively 1,500 schools spread between Ghana, Kenya, uh, and, and Nigeria, where we're doing teacher professional development, a lot of gender responsive pedagogy, basically training teachers to teach boys and girls the, you know, the same and equally in the classroom, doing a lot of community um, engagement, we call it community action um, mobilization, 
um, what assets does the community have? How can they use those assets to bring down barriers to, to girls' education and such? And so that's happening, and then at the same time, we're trying to change cultural norms um, uh, at a broader level through, uh, through these television shows. Discovery Plus takes on the name in each country of the dialing code, um, uh, which our producers came up with. So in, Dis in, in Kenya, it's Discovery Plus 254. In Ghana, it's Discovery Plus 233. So those are the dialing codes. So we have this umbrella brand that cashes in on some of the cachet of the Discovery brand, uh, but also is, is local. So all 26 episodes split between two seasons of 13. They're, they're locally produced, so it's essentially three different shows. You'll see in this clip that I'll, I'll show you, I sort of jump between all three versions, so it'll look like three different shows, which, which it, in fact, is. And the goal was to create an enabling environment, and doing that through changing attitudes and practices around girls' education, and doing that by demonstrating the value of girls' education. So instead of preaching at people about what they should do, we're demonstrating the value of something so people really understand it, internalize it, um, and, and can act upon it. We've done that um, in the health area, and we're applying that same principle here in, in education. So, and then the other piece is, is that it's sustainable um, in terms, both in terms of the project itself, but also how people internalize um, those, those changes and, and those, those life outcomes. We, there's a great responsibility and a great opportunity with mass media because you're speaking to society, you're, you're, you're changing, you know, if you're doing it right and you're intending to, you, you could change social norms, you could change it for the good or you could change it for the bad. So it is a great responsibility. Um, and you're changing the public dialogue. Television is a great, and when I say television, I mean you know, visual medium on any, any screen, so TV on any, in any sort of platform. But it's a great medium to change what people are talking about. And that's a great influence that this, um, this medium can have. This particular show, Discovery Plus, is a magazine-style show with in-studio guests, often celebrities or notable people. Um, there, are, um, there are musical guests, which are really key in drawing audiences. There are many documentaries and very grassroots stories, people overcoming obstacles. Um, and then we have youth reporters going out on the street doing interviews with people. And so what you have is this, and this ended up being a particularly helpful um, piece to the impact of the project, is that there's both this celebrity angle and this grassroots angle. So a celebrity comes into the studio, maybe famous architect in Nigeria, a famous chef in, in Kenya, um, or an actress in Ghana, comes in and talks and we share about, find a thread in their story about women's empowerment, how they're you know, mother got to where she was with her education, how that influenced her, how they overcame barriers to girls' education, things like that. And then we'll show perhaps a clip of, you know, girls in a rural area who stopped talking in order to go back to school and then come back to the studio so the celebrity and the host can talk about it. What do they learn from that? What, is it, what does it mean? What do they internalize? How does it relate to their own stories? Things like that. So that hopefully will give you a sense of the, um, um, the show itself. Let's play a clip. And again, this is like 60 seconds, and it's going to bounce around between, um, between all three shows. So we call it a sizzle reel. Um, so hopefully, if you think it sizzles, if I can get over here. And um, hopefully the audio will work. Let's see. No. Um, if I turn up the volume, like that. All right, this is going to be a little rough coming out of this speaker, but you'll get the idea. Welcome to Discovery Plus 234. Welcome to Discovery Plus 254. This is Discovery Plus 234. Absolutely. I'm Anita Erskine. This is the house of great music, the place for the this is my school and this is my community. You know, children, they are our tomorrow's leader. I will fight for the rights of those girls.
don't forget to share your views about the show by visiting our social media pages. Of all the forms of empowerment on earth, education is the strongest. She's a 46-year-old woman and she's actually in the same class as 12-year-olds. What men can do, women can also do it. What? Education can make you to be something great in this life. <laughs> So again, the goal is to, you know, use this entertaining medium to help people understand the true value of girls' education. So why, why use an entertaining medium? I mean, it's, some of this is, is hopefully somewhat obvious, but it's to reach a wider audience. You're going to get more people. But in particular, you're going to reach an audience that has no interest in girls' education whatsoever and may even be hostile to the entire idea. But you put a great you know, R&B artist on stage and a great personality and they'll watch the show and slowly um, those messages start to, uh, to sink in. It's cost effective. I um, mean, we're reaching, in this case, over 10 million um, across those three countries, probably upwards of 15. And so it's cost effective in, in that sense and also creates the opportunity. And this is what we're kind of wrestling and playing with. Can we create... Um, you know, a, a revenue generating platform here. Can we create a, a show that's entertaining enough um, that we can sell ads on that then um, could generate its own revenue so that at some point, you know, it can grow out of um, uh, funding from DFID, that DFID will sort of, you know, becomes that seed money to start something um, that then can grow on its own. That's a lot easier said than done when you're talking about these particular contexts that free to air television market is, um, is quite challenging as a revenue generator, uh, but it is something that's growing and that's, uh, that we're looking at. The last piece is that this entertaining medium and the using television makes it sticky. I mean, it makes the information sticky for two reasons. One is because it's visual, so it's engaging more areas in the brain. And secondly, because it's through communicating through stories, it's more emotional. And we know that when things are connected to our emotions, our brains retain them better. So we're, we're making it sticky because it's visual, and it's emotional. We had great success um, in terms of, uh, of audience reach. We surpassed all of our um, um, you know, initial distribution figures uh, by a factor of three or four. And in Kenya, by week four, it was the number three show, the number three non-live show. So taking out sports and news, it was the number three show in Kenya after just four weeks. So that, um, uh, that wasn't the hard, uh, the hard part. Uh, but building a revenue generating model out of it is, is particularly challenging. So what were the results? Um, just a, a quick snapshot. We did focus group studies uh, across three countries by doing um, gathering folks before the show aired and then after with a group of people that had at least seen four episodes. So you had to see four out of the 26 episodes. And we did you know, men and women, you know, younger, older, urban, and rural. So kind of a, a, a different, different groups of people. And essentially, I'll, I'll read a couple of quotes here from some of those uh, focus group participants. But what we found is that, or what our evaluator found, is that there was no longer discussion or debate about the value of girls' education. In the beginning, it was sort of like, girls' education, mm, pros, cons, ups, downs. After at least four episodes, girls' education was kind of a given. It was like, yeah, of course girls' education is valuable. Move, let's move on. Um, so that was the first uh, finding. The next is that it connected girls' education with positive family and community outcomes. So it wasn't just about that girl, but about her family and the community at large. One mother in Kenya said, when you start at a tender age educating a girl, you're not just educating that child, you're educating the whole community. Um, we also found positive attitudes uh, towards women's empowerment in general, beyond just girls' education. So one father in Ghana said, before I didn't like female empowerment, but sometimes when I watch that program, how the women are empowered through their education, I say that, what if my daughter becomes someone like them in the future? So that, that aspirational example uh, was really key to the success of the show. People were seeing women succeeding outside of the experience they were having um, in their own uh, immediate uh, community. Um, we also saw people talking about being empowered to return to school or or deal with other challenges that they're facing in their community. One young woman in Kenya said, the show has helped me know when I'm faced with a situation, how do I go about solving things like rape, like denying a girl child her education, or female genital mutilation, 
What do I do about it and what are our rights? For me, the program is a driving force. Um, we also found viewers internalizing the connection between education and success and the show, in particular segments and even specific guests on the show, two changes in, in what they were doing. So, you know, I saw, you know, this particular guest and therefore I went and talked to my husband about going back to school. I mean, very specific connections like that, which were interesting, uh, interesting to see. Also, and finally, family relationships changing, particularly amongst fathers, and we found this in all three countries. One, one father said, before watching the program, I never used to care about my daughter. I rarely went up country to visit her, but after watching the program, I changed my view, and now I visit her regularly, as she might grow up thinking her grandfather is her father. The relationship between a father and a daughter is very important. And sitting here, you know, the relationship between a father and daughter is important. It, that seems kind of obvious to us, but in, in other contexts, that, that's a real sea change um, in, in thinking um, and in, in, in cultural norms and in family norms. So that's really um, exciting to see. So I'll, let me stop here so that there is time for others and, and for questions, but just look forward to continuing the, the dialogue and, uh, and learning more from, uh, from these, these folks. Thank you very much. Great pleasure now to uh, formally introduce uh, Dr. Rachel Hinton. As I said before, uh, Rachel is uh, the uh, head of research, um, DFID and um, DFID's research program that um, is hugely supportive of a number of research efforts, uh, a big focus on, on systems research, and uh, as, as many of you here would know of the the program in the Blavatnik School. I think Rachel also is associated with the Blavatnik School, so many students here might be interested in uh, tracking you down and finding <laughs> you to talk about academic things, not funding. <laughs> and uh, Rachel will respond, and also perhaps uh, at the same time to introduce uh, Dr. Matt Reed, who uh, joins us uh, here from London today, uh, CEO for the Aga Khan Foundation, and to say formally how grateful we are for the support um, uh, not only of the, the study but the seminar series and uh, a conference to be held here in uh, in June this year mm -hmm. it's a it's a splendid partnership uh, one that uh, I think we'll we'll, we'll certainly um, hope to uh, extend over the years and grow it uh, you know grow it fruitfully um, and I think an excellent example of a, a partnership between an academic institution uh, and an organization whose, uh, whose work is, is so well known a, a across the world, um, its philanthropy, but also its capacity to research and ask interesting questions without uh, feeling that it needs to be uh, sort of, you know, locked into a kind of matrix of, uh, <laughs> of thing, things, uh, things to say and things not to say. So thank you so much and, uh, um, uh, for coming tonight. So, Rachel, do you want to you. Some <coughs> Slide. So, thank you very much, uh, David, and uh, all those organising this. It really is a, a pleasure to be here um, to discuss all of this. I've had the great privilege to see some of this work at country level, um, particularly in Ghana and in India, and, and where education technology is really um, being used to push the boundaries. And so, it's, it's really exciting to um, have the chance to debate this further. Um, I actually want to do two things um, in, in my um, contribution here. The first is sort of look at the bigger picture and why some of this work is um, you know, really important in the bigger education landscape. Uh, and the second thing is to actually discuss um, and share with you an opportunity um, that DFID and others are providing to produce evidence that actually could potentially spread and scale some of the actual um, innovations we have now rapidly um, coming up to actually improve value for money in, in delivering quality education for children across the globe. Um, so, what's the best? Okay, so just sort of putting this in the bigger um, context, um, education research does face, um, I would say, three big challenges. Um, the first, that a lot of the evidence is actually at a sort of micro level. So if you look in the sort of bottom corner there, we're often looking at sort of small-scale studies. 
And so one of the challenges we want to put on the table is how do you go from looking just at small scale studies that you can often control much more carefully to doing these things at scale. And I think um, this, these sort of big media um, examples are really um, an interesting case um, that we should be looking at. Um, the second thing is that we've have, had a prevalence of qualitative over quantitative data in, um, in the sector. And I think that's, um, you know, we need to shift that. And here we see, you know, work with David's study, for example, bringing in the use of experimental methods with control groups so we can actually genuinely and robustly talk about the impact that this is having. Um, and the, the work um, of Discovery, who through the Girls' Education Challenge, have also brought in both baselines and end lines to their work and are actually measuring um, not just some of these softer behavioural change, but they're actually looking at learning outcomes for children, because at the end of the day, it is the qualifications that children often will get and the skills they learn that will help them have productive lives in the future, and this genuinely does um, matter. It's not just being in school, but it's how much um, they're learning. Um, and I think, um, finally, we've, um, we haven't really had sufficient funding in the sector for there to be a body of knowledge that helps shift the debate and help us move forward. You know, does one intervention work or not? Do, do we need small school, school um, class groups or, or large? In lots of different areas where DFID has um, needed answers for our policy and programming, we found that we didn't have enough evidence, robust evidence, to do systematic reviews. We ended up having to do um, rigorous literature reviews, indeed, uh, uh, David himself would know some of these and has been involved in them, um, that we, we just don't have sufficient evidence. Um, I mean, Brookings estimated a few years ago that the health sector had 10 times more um, resources for research than the education sector. And I think um, we're very pleased that, for example, the Global um, Education Commission on Financing is recently really putting a spotlight on this issue that that there really does need to be more um, evidence and more resources for generation of evidence. Um, so I urge you to look at that um, commission report as well. So, what are um, the, the kind of big challenges as well in terms of why, you know, will some of this evidence have a difference, make a difference to the lives of children? At the end of the day, we're interested in, in, in that young girl in Ghana who's a Kaya, who's gone to the markets and is actually... Um, you know, portering and carrying goods around the market instead of being in school. We're interested in touching and changing the lives of those, those children. So is this research going to make a difference? Um, and I actually argue that some of the identity narratives of each of these groups means that we're not necessarily very good at working together. So as academics, we have incentives to um, publish and publish in high quality journals and write in a, perhaps a very academic language and um, we have a cycle of producing that research and publishing the papers. There are a few incentives to, for example, interact with the policy makers. And so, um, who have a different set of incentives? And the donors have a separate set of um, incentives. So it's very easy for me to um, integrate research into my own programmes and evidence into that, but it's much more difficult to integrate evidence into, say, what's happening at a government level. And then... If you think about education technology, I would argue you're adding another wheel altogether. I don't have a diagram of it, but and I would say that wheel is, is, is often going round and round over here with fantastic technical solutions to technical problems. But whether or not those technical problems and technical solutions are interacting with the realities of policymakers over, overloaded with information and the decision making they need to do is another question altogether. So do we have the right incentives? Well, I think um, obviously in um, the UK, they now have the REF that's actually giving um, credit for academics, um, you know, like David, who actually are having a policy impact with their research. But that isn't true um, in many places, and it would be interesting to hear whether we feel those incentives are sufficient to enable these different COGS to really work together. I just wanted to flag, because, because you're all Oxford people here, um, the fantastic work that's going on with Young Lives, which is also an Oxford-based um, programme. Um, many of you will, will know it, and I, I recommend you sort of go and have a look at that work on the website as well, because 
this is a, a really good example of where at scale research is happening over a long period of time and where um, now as the uh, lessons are coming out it really is interacting with policy makers and at the very highest levels interacting with national plans um, and influencing some of what they did. The work recently in Ethiopia for example on early childhood where some of the messages about you can't just add a, um, as Martin Woodhead would say, you can't add a dysfunctional carriage onto a train that's not moving and think that if you add an early childhood class and just carry on, everything will work. You have to look at what is needed in terms of pedagogy and so on if you want to bring early childhood into your system. And so, you know, having that very close relationships with the policy makers and respect for, with um, the policy makers is critical if we want the evidence we're producing to have um, an important impact. That's just. Um, I'd also say several of you have mentioned DFID, but we're not the only people deeply concerned about generating evidence. And um, indeed, in 2013, a lot of us came together and said, "Look, um, we're all concerned in two key things. Number one, raising the standards of research um, in the sector." Um, and secondly, working together so that we're not duplicating research, so that we can help try and pull resources to catalyse enough evidence in any one area to help us learn about what works to change um, learning for children. So this is a, um, has been a very um, useful group to come together and uh, meet regularly and also produce guidelines and guidance um, on the website for people to think about how do we assess standards of research in the sector. So I said I would share with you um, a kind of exciting opportunity that we have. Um, so this is an eight year initiative that um, DFID are, are doing within the education technology space to say let's think strategically about what the challenges are and what um, we should do as a community to try and learn um, from all of this exciting work that's going on. And there are two big um, questions that we would like to answer. One is, what works to spread and scale education technology interventions to <laughs> deliver learning outcomes for the poorest children? And secondly, which of these education technology interventions prevent um, the best value for money? So we heard from both our speakers that you know, the intervention is a good value for money, but what does that mean? And how are we measuring it? And are we measuring that with the same kind of metrics across programmes? Um, and how do we know um, if, a, if a Minister of Education, last week some of you know that there was the Education World Forum, so there were 80 education ministers in London all gathered together, and they want to know, you know they want advice, so what is the best technology solution to help us you know, make changes for our children, particularly those in, in the most um, rural areas, those that are really falling behind. And quite frankly, we don't have all the answers and we need better evidence to help us answer that. Um, so the, the challenges in the education um, technology sector, I think, are, are even more than um, just within the, the general education uh, space. Um, and I think that Pilots and early research haven't, um, you know, haven't always utilised a contextual understanding, and so I think this focus on understanding sort of the political economy, understanding local culture, is absolutely key. And very often, therefore, the costs of the intervention have been underestimated. So things have been costed at the hardware costs, not costed in terms of the fact that teachers might not turn up to deliver your program or that the schools don't have this, the, the right infrastructure or that the power supplies don't operate or that the televisions aren't necessarily in all the households that you think this intervention is going to reach. So some of these challenges are often underestimated in terms of cost um, and, and that's absolutely key. So um, what are the intended outcomes? Um, We'd like to, to actually end up with a, a robust body of evidence um, on what works. That's got, we've got sufficient lessons from across countries. We'd like to help spread and scale successful interventions. We'd like to understand new and innovative use of education technology. And we'd really like to see a shift in the multidisciplinary working. Um, so I think you know, it's really interesting to hear so many lessons coming, say, from health. But very often we do work in our sector groups. We're often 
you know, got our own bodies of knowledge and we often um, cluster together as academics. And actually, we need to break down those silos and work um, together across the disciplines. So, um, finally, um, yeah, we, we, how are we going to do this? Um, we want to create a, a global hub that brings people together. And you can find more information on, on the website and I'll pass around some leaflets for those of you or put them at the back perhaps for, for people who are interested. Um, and then we also want to um, tackle the practic practical challenges, but particularly focusing on three things. One, how do you improve individualised learning for children? Because we know a lot of what's happening in the classroom is at the wrong level, is often um, several steps ahead of where children are at, and therefore um, the majority often of a class aren't actually keeping up with what's being taught. Um, and there's, there's robust evidence to say interventions that address that are key. And obviously technology could play a, a key role here. We want to help um, on, around the whole issues around training and motivating teachers. And it was interesting, um, you know, David talking about how particular um, you know, resources and interventions can help motivate teachers. Um, and, then, and then accelerate the growth of small scale um, interventions. So, um, thank you very much. Thank you. And I have lots of questions too. <laughs> Sure. Shall I stand up here and just say a couple so, of things? Yeah. Is that, or Absolutely. Wherever, the place? Or, or, or wherever you like. Well, wherever. Well, yeah. why don't I, I'll stand up and yeah. then, that, then I'll sit down. Um, I was going to say uh, that, um, uh, Tariq, that uh, as I came in from the train, uh, I, I, I just sort of got here from a, a meeting in London. Uh, the word fun was, was, was writ large, and I was looking for a, um, because I have, you won't know this, several sort of Peter Pan-like outfits. And I thought, that's what I'm going to do tonight, <laughs> is put on one of my hats, because this is, this is enormous fun. But I thought better of it, I thought. <laughs> I'm going to act like a senior academic would. But it's true that, you know, all this stuff is, is great fun, and that we shouldn't... We well, shouldn't next share. time, then, we, we want the hat. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I, I also didn't bring a hat, I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, but look, well, thank you very much, and, and thank you for the kind words that you said about uh, the Agra Khan Foundation and the Agra Khan Development Network. I mean, we are delighted to be here. We're delighted to be doing this with Oxford University and others. Uh, as Rachel said, I mean, we think that, um, although uh, we think that we do very good work, we actually think that there's not enough of an evidence base about uh, what is happening in the education sector writ large. Uh, and so what we hope that you will do is tell us, uh, through studies like this, actually what we're doing wrong, how we could do it better, uh, and how all of us could learn from these kinds of experiences. So I think that's very much why uh, this is independent research. Uh, we want you to come in and tell us exactly what's working and what's not working. I'm delighted to hear uh, the, about the sort of things that, that have been working. I think it's very encouraging. Um, but what I think, uh, as Rachel was saying, what's really important is that we have objective, impartial uh, uh, evaluations, which is exactly why we wanted to, to partner with Oxford University in looking at, at our work, but also looking at, uh, at the work of other organizations and, and hopefully highlighting that sort of work uh, later in the summer. If I could just say a couple of things about the Aga Khan Development Network, uh, who I work for. I, I work for something called the Aga Khan Foundation. We are one of 10 development agencies that were founded by His Highness the Aga Khan to address uh, 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 development writ large uh, in Central South Asia and East Africa. We work uh, in fields from education to health to microfinance, cultural restoration, private sector development. Um, but five of our ten agencies are devoted to education. Uh, we work at the early childhood level. We were among the organizations uh, early, early on. I mean, we've, been, we've been focusing on early childhood for 30 years uh, and, and really trying to help build that case along with many, many others about why uh, focusing on the early years is important for introducing children to learning, uh, introducing and changing a culture of learning, and, and keeping them in school. We also work at the primary and secondary level uh, in, in uh, offering our own education uh, programs through our own education institutions. We run schools, uh, about 280 of them uh, in, in uh, Central South Asia uh, and East Africa. But we also work with public systems. So we want to work with public systems to try to improve the quality of learning in the classroom, the quality of teaching, 
uh, and to promote systems reform where we can. So we, in effect, what we try to do is use our own institutions as laboratories uh, for the kinds of things that we think might work uh, in other systems, uh, knowing full well that the context is quite different and we have to adapt some of those learnings to this context. And then finally, we work at the tertiary level uh, through universities. Now, uh, across all of this, what we want to do is uh, uh, promote children who, uh, who graduate uh, at whatever level uh, with the knowledge, skills, attitudes, and values for them to be successful uh, in life and productive members of society. That's what we're looking to do. Now, uh, and in that sense, I guess you would say that we're platform agnostic. Uh, we do it a lot through schools, through formal institutions, but I think one of the reasons that we are interested in how to use technology, how to use mass media, is to do this in, a, in as broad a way as possible. Because I think one of the things that, that, I, that I would would focus on a little bit is around how do you change a culture of learning. Uh, if you go uh, uh, to many of the countries where we're working, whether it's in East Africa, West Africa, uh, India, where I've spent uh, a lot of time over the past three years, I was based there, uh, in Central Asia, uh, the culture of learning, that is to say, uh, going to school, the value of going to school, especially the value of sending girls to school, making resource choices about which of your children you send to school, that culture of learning has to be reinforced. A lot of times what we find is that there's a general sense that I, you know, most people think education is a good thing. But when it comes down to it, what they have to do is say, well, actually, do I want to send... That girl could be doing chores today. You know, uh, I was in uh, Kuala County of Kenya, uh, in, in November meeting with some uh, with, with a group of, of, of students and, and teachers who are dealing with uh, who are dealing with students and they said you know a lot of times it's a, it's, it's a, one of the, the most inhibiting factors for girls getting in school is this whole issue of who has to do the, the, the chores at home who's going to help cook those meals who is actually going to help uh, 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 contribute revenue to that household um, the same, uh, you have the same issue with boys, but oftentimes it's quite acute for girls in certain contexts. And so I think one of the things that uh, we're interested in this kind of technology, mass media, uh, uh, one, of, one of the reasons we're interested in it is how do you promote at a broader level just the inclination to allow kids to go to school at, at, at a very level. And so if you can, through game shows, uh, through, I think, your, the initiative that, that you're talking about and, and uh, that Discovery Channel is, is involved with in East Africa sounds great. Anything that we can do to create that culture of learning seems to me is quite important. In addition, uh, I think what, what's interesting about your study and what I'm encouraged by and would like to hear a little bit more about is how it actually encourages learning uh, directly. Uh, I mean, I think those two things are quite important. I guess I'd like to know a bit more in your study uh, how you're looking at that question of the cultural change. Uh, a bit how it would be good to hear a bit of more about that because from our perspective it's one of the things that um, that, 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 that where, where we see a role for technology uh, uh, to play. Um, I guess the last thing I would say is that um, we in, in line with, Eric, with what Eric was saying we shouldn't underestimate this issue of fun. I mean we all know from the countries where uh, where we work that oftentimes if you go to a public school, it is anything but fun. Mm -hmm. I mean, in fact, that's precisely the problem. The, 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 the teaching, either the way things are taught or even the way that the teachers are taught to teach. It's rote learning. Uh, it, it's a lot of sort of, you know, blackboard, sitting in, um, uh, in chairs. And uh, the whole notion of interactive learning, getting kids to interact with materials, interact with each other, is something that is underemphasized. And so we find that in classrooms, that's really important. So anything that we can do, through technology or otherwise, to get that kind of interaction going, I think, is something that, that we think is important. And so I was, uh, uh, I was it, it, glad to hear both of you talk about that. And if... Uh, I guess what I would want to know is whether or not your study is also looking to some degree at the effect of that interactivity uh, on, on learning outcomes. Um, with that, I will stop, but I, uh, I want to say thank you both very much. We are excited about this work, and I look forward to hearing more about it. Thanks so much. Thanks. Excellent. Thanks very much. We uh, have a sorry we started a bit late, but uh, maybe just about 15, 15 minutes and a bit more for sort of formal questions. And of course, 
uh, as ever, there's some drinks at the back and uh, encourage you to stay and, uh, and ask a few more. Um, uh, would you like me just to respond very quickly um, much of those two questions, which I think are very, very um, insightful and um, important. Um, so, on the on the business of cultural change, of course, this is a you know it's 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 a huge topic. But just to give um, one illustration of the the uh, power of the television show is that uh, you know parents all over Kyrgyzstan or Kenya or Tanzania, etc. And particularly the Kyrgyzstan show that uh, encourages and you know uh, which at its heart is the is is the concept of uh, of fun. Uh, I think we yeah, we might just roll a two minute video or something like this. But you know parents and children you know ca carrying a ball between each other you know with their foreheads and uh, you know or, or sort of sack races and great deal of laughter uh, and so on. But um, the transformative um, capacity uh, for this, in, in, in um, you know, certainly in my study, is that um, it, it transforms the way in which people approach um, books and meaning making uh, in homes. The the, uh, the show, um, I, I think, is uh, uh, allows people to imitate ways in which to ask. Questions, ways in which to pose questions uh, to children uh, reading, and so these transitions that the the television show uh, makes, and that's why I felt it was actually important to study um, the nature of the, of, of the show. But what we're finding in homes uh, across many many homes uh, is is uh, it acts as a as a wonderful platform for modelling, for for imitation, for parents to understand and recognise that there are many many different ways in which. Uh, we can engage with our own children and uh, you know uh, with books uh, and um, and so on. Uh, so that uh, uh, you know that's uh, that, that's important. The second question about interactions again is is such an Im important question and at the heart of the study, of course, is you know can we um, <clears throat> can we capture some of the uh, this this new dialogue, the social dialogue, and and really we take seriously the notion that. It is that intersubjectivity, uh, the, the use of a game show, the use of um, uh, you know a talk show um, that uh, encourages um, dialogue and discussion um, when when people move move away from it. So as 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 they turn the television off or as they walk to the bus stop. Uh, in, in, in the case of, 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 of these shows, uh, they have a, a, a basis, a common platform for a dialogue that goes beyond what they might have spoken about had that mediating role of uh, artifacts like television or talk shows and so on not been there. So, um, you know, we, we see an enormous uh, potential um, uh, to, to extend the, the, the kind of academic argument, the academic evidence. Um, uh, for this, and, and I think, as um, as, as Rachel said, um, also um, that we have now very clear ways of, of looking at the lasting impact uh, of these uh, uh, things on, on cognitive development and uh, and growth. Um, but, um, um, okay, I mean, shall we just throw it open to a few questions? Uh, do, do we just take two or three at a time? Uh, Yourself there, and, and if you could introduce yourself, that'd be good. Yourself and Helen, and anyone else? No, yes, okay. Um, hi, my name is mm. Olia. I'm mm. studying environmental change and management. Mm. I have a question specifically for David mm. uh, about the game show, and mm. I guess the question of why mm. uh, and culture mixing mm. together. Does your study in some way explore, um, I guess, the, the cultural background? of um, what books meant to people in Kyrgyzstan 20 years ago, 25 mm. years ago, because during the Soviet Union, mm. uh, books were big parts of mm. households. Mm. Uh, people were lining up mm. to pick up books, mm. and it sort of remained and passed on, mm. but in the last decade or so, this is where mm. it sort of went along and, uh, and sort of fell apart. Mm. So maybe does this game show kind of bring back that mm. culture that they had during the Soviet mm. Union, and it's... Maybe this is why the game show is so well mm. received mm. there, and mm. it could be well received in other mm. Central Asian countries. Mm. Um, and I guess 
could this be replicated in other places mm. and will it hold the same success mm. maybe in East Africa mm. where maybe mm. that previous culture did not exist sure yeah um, that's great uh, I'll, uh, do you want to ask yours uh, the same thing? Uh, yes Helen Campbell mm. Hickford um, mm. at the Department of Education here mm. Um, I've done a lot of work in um, theatre for development. Uh, I've done a lot of work with people who were using um, radio soap operas and to some extent television soap operas um, you know, that had educational and development messages in. And the great thing about theatre for development is that you, the downside is that you're only performing probably to 300 people. But the good thing is that you can immediately see whether they're understanding what you're talking about. And you can have a question and answer session and if necessary you can repeat the bits that they didn't get first time. Um, and you can get a kind of absolutely immediate understanding of the impact. And of course you can then you know, do a question and survey or whatever if you want to. So it's small scale but very sort of immediate and measurable. And I'm just wondering how with the television Firstly, how do you assess um, the existing level of understanding before you produce a television show? And secondly, how do you then capture the impact of having watched the television show? Um, you know, particularly if it's distributed across 10 million people, you know, how do you assess what they've learned from, um, you know, what are the kind of the, the capture technologies for, for assessing that impact? Mm -hmm. Okay, gosh, always hard questions. <laughs> Do you want to slip on in? Yeah, um, mm. So, my question is about the Discovery Plus mm. program, um, which is really, really interesting. Um, I was wondering kind of what type of TV coverage you have in the areas um, that you're working in. Um, just because I imagine kind of in urban, middle income areas, there's a lot more televisions, but in the kind of more rural areas or the bottom of the pyramid have less access to that. So are, are you kind of targeting a specific, specific demographic? Um, and then other than the focus group discussions you mentioned, how else are you kind of trying to measure the um, social and behaviour changes? <coughs> Sorry, what was your name? Sorry, I'm Sabina. I'm studying on the um, comparative education course. Okay, excellent. Um, just, uh, uh, I'll try and uh, yeah, just uh, some very quick remarks. Uh, wonderful uh, uh, set of questions, actually. Uh, uh, wonderful. Uh, so I think you're absolutely right on the... Um, you know, the political and economic uh, aspects, the, uh, the decline of the uh, post-Soviet uh, uh, economies. And with that, of course, came a decline in things like the culture of reading because uh, people had to think very carefully about what they spend their money on. So the demand for books, of course, uh, and other kinds of reading materials, magazines, which might have been seen to be a luxury, that clearly declined. So why the television game show and how might it redress that? And I think I was careful to say in my opening remarks that um, it would be wrong to think of a television game show as a, as a political uh, factor in uh, addressing uh, you know, political and economic problems. But what it does do, and, and this is why we're so hopeful, is that it is reinvigorating a, uh, a culture of reading. And I think the, the why, you know, why was it set up? It was set up precisely to, to reinvigorate, to, to, to recreate uh, the, um, uh, you know, a, a love for reading amongst, uh, amongst uh, uh, children to sort of... Um, um, and, and what it has done is that it, it has increased the demand for, uh, for books I've spoken to many librarians in the, uh, in the study uh, that I did in, in both Bishkek and, and, and Osh. And the librarians were, were just amazed and, and you know, attribute directly uh, the, the, the footfall through their doors uh, for books to, uh, to, to the stimulus that the television game show uh, has produced. It's transformed the way in which parents have thought about uh, the importance of reading and so um, where there is a little bit more money, then people are beginning to spend it on particularly the books recommended by the game show, the books that, uh, because for children to participate, of course, they need to read three recommended books and, 
answer questions that go up on the television screen by text uh, message. So, of course, there's a, a real scurry to get hold of these, uh, these books and that. So, so it increases demand, but it also increases, uh, you know, uh, I mean, the incentives, as, as, as Rachel uh, was, was talking about, is, is quite clear for, for, for households. So in terms of the cultural the potential for transformation, I think, uh, I think for all those reasons, uh, you know, it's absolutely great. Is it replica, uh, replicable uh, in Africa? Absolutely. Will it have potentially the same effect? Absolutely, I think, right? It's uh, because they, they, it, it does act as a stimulus and, and precisely this notion that it acts as a, um, a model, but it reinforces a message about the importance of reading uh, and reading together, the, you know, the fact that uh, reading, you know, um, on, on the whole is sometimes a solitary activity and, of course, as, you know, secondary school kids are not going to sit on the knees of their dads or mums and, and read together. I mean, that, you know, uh, but why would, we, you know, why would we think that? But I think for, for, for younger age groups, particularly those who are beginning to read, the value of this kind of interaction, intersubjectivity, where adults mediate children's understandings of the world through text is, 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 is fundamental. Um, Helen, your uh, point about, uh, you know, very good point, very clear. I think the existing levels of um, reading, um, I mean, f first of all, I think is, uh, you know, uh, one, one might argue that, um, uh, you know, it's a, it was a very well-known fact that uh, reading, uh, uh, the culture of reading had declined, um, so children just aren't reading enough, and we could evidence that actually uh, through a demand for, for reading materials for books and, and so on, and, and, and that, um, I think, uh, was clear. Uh, it was particularly weak, so uh, school libraries don't contain... And we, you know, we know that this to be true in many African countries and South Asian countries. There aren't libraries, and where they are, you know, they're not kind of stacked with every series of, uh, you know, um, uh, whatever it is children read these days, and so on. So, 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 so yeah, you know, we, we we can certainly evidence it on that uh, on, on that level. Um, but also the, the the kind of baseline evidence is, um, you know, national. Uh, tests of um, of learning and literacy and uh, Kyrgyzstan, uh, you know, wisely or unwisely, you know, um, participated in the PISA studies, for example, and so they they know from uh, uh, national evidence and uh, benchmarks of, of, of that kind uh, that they know, you know, that children are not reading as well as um, comparative countries uh, else, elsewhere. So there's a big policy drive to uh, re-embed, to reinvigorate, to, uh, you know. Uh, so, of course, uh, th those, are, those are the baselines. So how would we know, and I think this is just an important general lesson, I, I always give this example of the, and you may have heard it before, the 1970s in, in, in the U.S., a very similar, uh, oh, you know, why Johnny and later, why Johnny and Jane can't read. I have to remember the books, Johnny, uh, John and Jane. So a, a white paper, why Johnny and Jane can't read. And the, the answer, the policy answer, it appeared, lay in the fact that there, that there were not enough reading materials. Now this is, 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 is potentially true. So in the US, literally, I think they still call them dumper trucks. They filled dumper trucks filled with fiction and non-fiction books and dumped them in, in, into middle schools. And the evidence uh, that the scientists were looking for was whether the reading age increases uh, and, and, and improves. Well, actually, they didn't find that at all. What they didn't look at, uh, sadly, was whether you know, reading behaviors, a culture of reading and so on, uh, uh, improved. So the experiment, if you like, which is called a book flood experiment, was seen to be not uh, successful. Ten years later, in the UK, we replicated the study in Bradford, uh, north, north of England, the Bradford book flood experiment. But as, uh, as researchers, sorry, not, not me, just talking about the community, uh, I was too young. <laughs> um, the uh, research community started looking for other kinds of ev uh, evidence. So again, at a, you know, the uh, cognitive push, 
uh, it seemed like flooding schools with books didn't quite do the, 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 the trick. Uh, children's reading ages weren't sensitive to the provision of, of more books. But we, we certainly saw that their reading behaviors uh, there, they were reading more, the demand for reading uh, increased. Uh, possibly the, the kind of culture of, uh, of uh, speaking, that, that increase, and, and, and we've got good evidence, um, good evidence for that. Um, when I uh, replicated the book flood experiment in Pakistan, again 10 years after that, th there was an enormous impact, and it's not because there was something magical about the study, it was just that uh, the importance of, um, you know, that schools mattered in, in Pakistan. There was sort of 5,000 uh, middle schools to which we distributed books, um, uh, 18 fiction and 18 non-fiction titles written in, in, in local uh, languages. And that, uh, over the three or four years we tracked that study, had an, had an, enormous, uh, had an enormous impact. So I think the, um, you know, your question is a very good one. What, what sort of baseline evidence do we have? Uh, but also, what, you know, what, what can we actually learn from comparable experiments of this kind, comparable studies of this kind, uh, over the last few uh, decades? And I think we know that, uh, A, uh, the increased supply of books and, of course, increasing the demand for reading is an important, um, is an important, uh, uh, important stimulus to, uh, to reading. Perhaps managing reading a bit uh, more tightly, so the UK, again, you know, love it or hate it, but the, the literacy are a much more sort of, uh, you know, structured way of uh, engaging um, with books uh, became an important sort of policy step um, for the UK. And uh, what I'm not suggesting for Kyrgyzstan is a sort of literacy hour, but I do see, as I said in my presentation, a wonderful bridge uh, between the cultures of home and, and, and school and a way in which both sites uh, can, can work together to, to, to increase the reading. I mean, just, just to add to the, the example of the books, I think um, it would, anyone who'd like to look at the rise, the research into improving systems of education website, there's some really good papers on there from, in particular, Lance Pritchett, who argues that the inputs alone are not going to shift anything. And I think this is particularly important in discussing technology because I think some of the failure has been to think that tablets in schools or giving laptops to kids or smart boards in a classroom will alone shift learning. And uh, those of us <laughs> inside the education system know that it is much broader than that. It is about the enabling environment, it's about the parental engagement, it's about the materials being at the right level, it's about the incentives, it's about the feedback loops. At every point, it's about the wider political economy. And yet... Most research in education is about inputs, and most spend is on inputs. And some governments, I mean, I worked in, in Ghana for, for several years, um, they spend 97% of their budget just on teachers' salaries, but 30% of the overall GP goes into education. It's a huge amount of investment that countries are making for education, and very little of that is having a difference to children's learning, and so there are huge um, challenges we have to, to move the dial on this. Sure. <clears throat> um, well, first, Helen, yours um, question in, in, in theater, which is which is so great, and I've seen that um, work so well in in several different contexts in terms of um, conflict resolution, health, and, and things like that. Um, it, it is it is quite immediate and and, and visceral and exciting. Your question then about how do we how do we go about making sure that we're tapped into the audience is sort of in a nutshell it's formative research, consulting with experts, doing a little bit of production, and then doing focus group testing. So okay, we thought we were saying this, but are we really somehow we're communicating this? That's not right. And then going back to the drawing board. So it's a bit of an iterative process, and not wanting to trying to make sure that we don't spend too much money. Um, you know, too fast. You know, do a little bit of production, test it, a little bit more, test it, do a season, test that, do a second season on the lessons learned. That's how we sort of went about it with, with Discovery Plus. Um, the question about assessment, which is also Sabina's question, so, yeah, it's, it's, it's really challenging. So we have to be realistic about the targets, 
and about the um, about coverage. So even if more than half of Ghana has a television or has access to television, that doesn't mean that it's evenly distributed, rural and and urban, or um, you know by by other sort of social economic factors. So we need to know that and we recognize that there isn't great data out there, you know, detailing and articulating that sort of. You can get that data to some extent by country, and it'll be like. You know, 66% of Kenya has access to television on a weekly basis. But how that distributes by 47 counties in Kenya, that, that, that unfortunately right now doesn't exist. And in only certain areas can you get viewership um, data on specific networks. Now, that's even in the time between the, the, you know, the measurement of our show in Kenya and now there's significantly better data in Kenya, um, you know, just a year later. So it's growing rapidly. There's also a connection there between um, data and advertising, because no one's going to spend money to advertise if you don't have the data. And so, but no one has the money to get the data until there's advertising, right? <laughs> so you're trying to figure out how do I infuse something into this, you know, vicious cycle to turn into a virtuous one, it, it, which is challenging. So we know that it's used, you know, by social economics. We know it's used urban, but it's also growing very fast, um, exceptionally fast. And again. We like to think about it in terms of television on multiple screens. So obviously, you know, people always talk about cell phones and the misnomer that many Americans, I guess, you know, from my context would have is that they think that every eighth grader, you know, in northern Nigeria is walking around with one of these. <laughs> um, that's, you know, that's not happening. So the fact that there are a lot of feature phones, you know, doesn't mean that it's widely distributed again. And it doesn't mean that it's distributed by gender evenly or by age evenly. Um, but like television, smartphones are beginning to um, you know grow very very fast. So we want to be on the you know on the cutting edge of that. So when people are getting on, and when they do have enough money for television, they are buying one. Um, so we want to get ahead of that. And it's it's distributing faster than the electrical grid. So Safaricom now has like M-Pesa for um, you know for yeah, um, you know texting money. Now they have M-Copa, which is um, these these you know um, flat screen solar power televisions. Um, that's an interesting economic model. It's interesting to see how it develops. Essentially, you have to get um, your the battery, the 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 charging station of this the cell, um, the the solar cells to the television is connected to the sat the uh, it's connected to your cellular network. So you have to keep buying credits on the cell network to get the battery to operate. Even though the sun is free, the battery usage isn't. I don't know how that model is going to work for them, but, but the inter there's an interesting things happening. We're, we're following it very closely. But interesting that they're trying to get televisions out there beyond the electrical <coughs> grid. Um, that's, that's a fascinating little uh, business they've got, they've got going. And then in terms of measurement, you know, it's, it's focus group testing, pre and post. It's not randomized control trials, which we like to see. Frankly, there isn't, broadly speaking, and DFID is the exception to this, there, there isn't a lot of appetite in many of the donor, and much of the donor community for serious M&E. DFID is by far and away on the cutting edge of that and willing to put serious money um, behind M&E because it, it requires serious money. To do household surveys in a rural area is a serious undertaking. Um, you know, when, when we have private sector donors or other smaller foundation donors, you know, they feel like they know intuitively what the impact is. And so it's hard to, it's hard to have a million dollar project and a million and a half dollar M&E budget. Like m most people just can't, can't swallow that. Um, so it's, it's somewhat limited, um, you know, different on the, on the cutting edge of that in many ways. In terms of that, that number though of reach, we also have to be realistic, but also, but the positive side of that realism is that a small percentage of a really big number is still a really big number. So if you're reaching 5% of you know, 200 million people, that's a lot of people that you're reaching with, with one television show that you can create over here, relatively low cost. You can cut some of that cost by infusing some ad dollars in there, and you can reach 20 million people. So there's this, there are a lot of different sort of you know, valuations and equations that you know, one can do in different contexts. Uh, but you have to be realistic about it, for sure. Is that, is that helpful? Yeah, that's very helpful. Thanks. 
Excellent. Um, thank you. I think we better formally uh, close, and then there's some um, wine and orange juice at the back. But I uh, hope you would uh, join me uh, to thank our guests in the, in the usual way. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.